Church, give me an amen. amen. The prophecy of Hosea, chapter 4. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. I've been trying to get away, really, from these verses, but I think every session we've had since Sunday morning, when I get up here, these verses somehow pop up in my little old bald head, and I can't get away from it. So let's read it together. I really appreciate the song, Fill Me, Fill Me Now. It is God's will for every person to be saved. And once you're saved, you need to be seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. You don't have to be afraid of that. You ought to be afraid not to try to live in the fullness of the Spirit. It is utterly impossible to live the lifestyle that's described in our New Testament without being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. Of course, it's a requirement for deacons, for, for preachers, but that doesn't mean that it's just something for the, those who, are, who aspire to lead God's people. It's for every child of God. The victorious Christian life is the Spirit-filled life. And when He tells us to be filled, the word means to be controlled. So it really is not describing whether or not you swing on the chandeliers and fall down and bite your neighbor on the ankle. But, uh, I'm, you know, that's in reference to that rolling in the floor outfit. But, but you know why we make fun of those people? At least they are seeking the fullness of God. And uh, we need to realize the laugh's on us if we're not really seeking the fullness of God. And so as we pray, not just every day, but all during the day, we should be praying, Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me now. And as we pray in faith believing, the Lord wants to answer that, so He'll begin to work things around, and He'll show you this, and He'll deal with that. Even though He knows it comes when we yield ourselves to Him, so He'll just start, you know, convicting and influencing us and putting us around the right people and showing us the things in the Bible that will bring us to a place of total submission of our life to Him. Amen. Amen. Well, while I'm on it, let me just stay there a minute. That feels pretty good. Now, a lot of times we sing, I surrender all, but that's the wrong word. Submit is the right word. Submit. Because see, you surrender when somebody pulls a gun on you. And you throw your hands up. One of the Negro spirituals, they're singing in the South now, uh, about surrendering to the Lord. It goes like this. Come out of there with your hands up. That's good, ain't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Come out of there with your hands up. And so, that's good. It's good. I like it. I told Joanne if I was going to be in, reincarnated, I'd want to come back as a black preacher. <laughs> and so, because that's my crowd. They'll talk back to you when, when but anyway, when, when you... When you submit, someone's got. When you surrender, someone's got a knife pulled on you, or or maybe a maybe a Kmart blue light special has gone off in your rearview mirror, and so you pull over. You got one, did you, Hoss? So, so when you have one of those blue light specials, you're fixing to get an autograph. Say amen again. But you see, when you got that ticket for doing 72 and a 55, was it? And and you see, when you, when you got that ticket, you surrendered. Uh, and you might outrun the Ford, but you can't outrun his radio. And so you, you take the ticket. But it's 3 a.m., you're on the interstate, there's nobody traveling but the deer. And so after you drive about an hour, I mean, you've got the ticket and it's in your pocket, but you're trying to get home. And there's, there's no cars. You can't see a headlight or a taillight. And so you've been driving a double nickel now for an hour, so you start driving 60. And then it's 68. And you see what happens, sir. You surrendered, but you didn't submit. And when we come in here and Pastor Hammett preaches something that crosses the way we live, which is frequently the case, and we feel so guilty and convicted and 
Then Brother John comes and he sings, I surrender all. And so we come to the altar because the Holy Spirit has taken that word and shown us we're wrong and he's right. Say amen. amen. So we come down here and surrender. We get it right. But along about Thursday, we start doing it again. Problem is we surrendered, but we didn't submit. So we really need to submit to the authority of God, not just the issue, the issue, issue or that issue, but just really submit to Him and to the lifestyle He has described in the New Testament. Oh, how we need to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Oh, you say, I'm afraid if I get filled with the Spirit, I might talk in the unknown tongue. <laughs> Honey, the best way I know not to talk in the unknown tongue is to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone didn't enjoy that last round there. There are squirrels in them holes. Let's look now in Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter number 4. Thank you for the good song service. What a privilege we have to worship the Lord. Say amen. amen. Do you love him? Say amen. amen. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Verse 6, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now this word controversy in verse 1 comes from the Hebrew word reeb. And the word reeb means to push, to shove, to grapple, to wrangle, to chide, to complain. Now this is talking about God. God has a controversy and the word controversy means to complain, to contend, to debate, to rebuke, to strive, to wrestle. So I want to preach a few minutes on when God gets upset. This word describes a God who's upset. You don't believe he can get upset, do you? He can. I, I saw, I saw this, uh, this uh, psalm over here. Let me read. It said, But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. He can get upset. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the wonderful privilege we have to seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. And then by faith we believe that we'll hear from heaven and that you will forgive our sin and heal our land. Thank you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we we're so grateful for your people in the way that the people of God have been willing to listen to all of this negative preaching and then respond and repent and pray and respond and pray and repent and confess night after night. I thank you for it, Lord. And I'm so excited. My, my soul's just jumping around inside of me, thinking about the wonderful revival that we're having. 
And I know that some casual uh, gazer or a preacher taster or a passerby wouldn't think anything's happening. But praise God, the wonderful things that are happening in our hearts and in our homes and our relationship with Thee. Thank You for the privilege we have to confess and repent and trust You for revival. Good old-fashioned, sin-killing, devil-chasing, Christ-honoring revival. We thank You in Jesus' name. Help us now, and in Jesus' name, help us to be open to Thy truth. Lord, show us this negative aspect of Thy nature, and may it instill a fear and a reverence in our heart that we not tread on, in Thy courts and trample under our feet the blood of Christ, that we yield our life to You and be saved and then be filled with the Spirit. Be merciful to the lost sinners that are here. Please don't let them have a heart attack and die and go to hell before the invitation times but, c comes, but may they come and be saved. May every child of God be revived, and may every unsaved person be saved for the glory of God, and in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, Hosea is prophesying in 760, 770, and 780 uh, B.C., and uh, of course that means he's contemporary with Isaiah, and they were, they were no doubt preacher buddies and acquainted and prophesied. And because this is, uh, this, this is after the first uh, Assyrian captivity, that's the northern kingdom captivity. And so they're preaching about the same time. And so all we know about Jose is just this story, you know, of Gomer and, and the analogy of the picture of Israel and her whoredoms and how that... God wants her to come back. But if you, if you will uh, bear with me a moment, I'll read to you a few verses from Isaiah's prophecy when Isaiah preached just about the same time. And so since Isaiah's preaching about the same time, he gives us a little bit more vivid description of the condition of the people and, and what's going on in the land. He said, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, if you don't mind, sort of listen for America and listen for your community as I go through here. This is showing us the condition of the land in the day of this prophecy that we're going to look at for a few minutes. He said, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. Somebody say amen. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. That's backsliding, sliding back. Uh, Jose called him a backslidden heifer. Uh, the picture is a cow trying to climb up a bank and it loses its footing and slides back. And so you may not consider yourself to be a backslider, but if there was ever a time in your life when you were closer to Christ than you are now, then you must be a backslider. If there was ever a time you were more in the will of God, or ever how you want to say it, more in the will of God, or closer to Him, or filled with Him, if there was ever a time you were a better Christian, sir, ma'am, than you are tonight, then I want to look you right in your God-given eyeballs and accuse you of being a backslider. Oh, you say, preacher, backsliders are, are out of Sunday school now. That crowd that won't come to church, I don't even believe they're saved. Most of the backsliders are in church. You say, you're so narrow, you don't think there's anyone saved but Baptists. You missed it. I don't believe half of Baptists are saved. Why should ye be stricken any more? God says, why should I whoop you anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores and they have not been closed neither modified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Well, that sounds like reading the paper. I'm wondering if he's going to say they're burning your flag in the evening news. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it. I'm fed up with these Wahoo, Yehu, Hindu, Muslim, and all this out. Listen, and they want to preserve their culture. Honey, if, 
listen, don't talk to me about Chinese American, uh, uh, Japanese American, African American. Thank God just be an American. Amen. They say, oh, we want to resolve our culture. Then, then stay in India if you want to resolve your, you, reserve your culture. We are Americans. The name of the game is not skin. It don't make any difference what color your skin is. Thank God for the privilege to be saved, say amen. amen. And I thank God for the privilege to be an American. And if you're not glad you're one, we'll take up an offering and buy you a one-way ticket. You might as well fashion your seatbelts, boys. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it. That sounds like the local welfare program. Uh, in your presence, and it's desolate and as overthrown by strangers. And the, daughters of Zion, and the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard, as a lodge and a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been... Listen... Unless, unless we had some saved people in America, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. God's left us a remnant. And the Christian community happens to be the minority. We're the, in the minority now. We are a minority group. Maybe Washington will send us a check. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah, listen now. To, listen, listen, this is the condition of the land. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks and of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, your new moons and your appointed feast. And my soul hateth. They are a trouble to me. I'm weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my face. I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet. You see the verses that lead up to this monumental 18th verse? of Isaiah 1 that we love, oh, we love that. Songs are written on it, sermons are preached on it. But you see how heavy God's heart is. He's saying, you sorry outfit, you've broken all of my laws. Your, your religion is just a mockery. You don't mean it when you pray. You don't mean it when you burn incense. I'm sick of it. I don't want to even hear any more of it. Get away from me. Get him. Then he said, come now, come. I'm talking about a God that ought to say, he ought to say, go. He ought to say, go to hell. And he, and only he is qualified to say, go to hell. But instead of taking that position of go, he said, come. That makes me want to shout like a Comanche. He said, come, come. Come, come. Jesus could have said, go, but he said, come unto me. Oh, you that labor and are heavy laden, come. And here is Jehovah God, and he could say, go, out of my face, out of my face. But he says, come, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. If you ever get a hold of that, you'll run plumb to Baltimore. Come now, let us, let us reason. He's going to give you a chance to speak. What are you going to say? Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Boy, I'm tempted to preach on that. Go back now to our text in, uh, in Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter number 4. And let's look at this controversy. This controversy. 
Let me say again, even though our God is a sovereign God, he is still affected emotionally. We can give him pleasure and our disobedience can bring anger and he's God. And, uh, and this word means to grapple, to wrangle, to chide, to complain, to contend, debate, rebuke, strive. And so I'm talking about when God gets upset. And I want us to expound on the first two verses. We probably won't mention verse 6, but the first two verses of Hosea chapter 4. Number 1, God is upset because there isn't enough truth. Now, I know that you folks feel like you're unique and that you have the tremendous preaching ministry of your pastor in the Sunday school, and I'm very impressed with, with the teaching of the Word of God here. I don't know if God is or not, but I am. But you wouldn't believe some of the places that we have the privilege of going and just how little preaching and teaching of the Word of God that we have and how the emphasis is on this or that or some southern gospel quartet or something in these church. I mean, I mean a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. And God's upset. Now, uh, now I want to challenge you to continue to teach and to preach and to read the Word of God. And just because you have some here, one here that can spoon feed you, it doesn't mean that you do not have a responsibility to read the Word of God and to study the Word of God in your home. Amen. And mothers and daddies need to get their children together and study the Word of God. Some of these little family devotions, just some little something, you know, while the commercial's on the tube. But we need to diligently study and preach and teach. You daddies and husbands need to act like a priest or a pastor to your own family. You need to get serious about training your children. Listen, the, the Christian school does not relieve your responsibility to train and to teach your children at home and not just from the Word of God, but by example. Most of the character that our children need is not taught, it's caught. Teach them the truth and then don't be a slimy hypocrite. Teach your children to be faithful to the house of God. Then don't stay out some Sunday and play golf with the boys, you hypocrite. You won't have to go home and scratch your head all night and figure out what that meant in the Greek, will you? We need to walk the walk while we talk the talk. It's so dangerous, it's so detrimental to the heart of a young person when they see inconsistencies in the life of their mama and their daddy. And if there's one crooked thread on you, buddy, your children know it. Pastor, those, those precious homes today we were talking about, that's been on me, oh, that's been on my heart. And those homes where those folks are lost that we were talking about, when we stand at the Bema, we'll find out that there's something fishy. There's, there's something crooked going on. There's something out of place. There's something, there's some inconsistency. There's something, there's something wrong when these so-called great Christian families have children that turn out to be hoodlums. And if your children are going to the dogs, somebody's leading them there. And if it's some public school mess or some carnal grandparent, you, daddy, you, mama, you, daddy, you are allowing it. And some of you run a real clean ship at home, then you let your kids go over to so-and-so and spend the weekend. Well, don't you come around one of these days and tell God that they did it to your kids. You did it to your kids. You're the one that's responsible. You better call the shots. I say you better give the orders because one day Jesus is going to call you on the carpet and you men will have to give an account for yourself and your wife and your children. Amen. Amen. Not enough truth being taught and being preached. Pastor, would you stand, please? Would you stand. Folks, can I preach to him just a moment? You want me to? You want me to lay it on him? Lay it on him? All right, listen up. Listen up. <laughs> sir, listen up, sir. God is going to hold this congregation responsible for what he shows you. Aha. Uh -huh. 
He won't just hold you responsible, yes, but he'll hold these people responsible for what he gives you. Don't you hold back. When God gives you something in your study, and I know you're a student and you dig in that word, so many of the preachers just kind of scratch around on the surface like a, like a garden tiller. But this fellow will, will dig a shaft down into that truth and he'll draw and he'll draw and he'll draw from that truth. But that's not just for his little private Bible study. A man of God doesn't have a private Bible study. What God the Holy Ghost gives that pastor, he's giving it to you. And what he gives you, he wants them to have. Go ahead and load their wagon. Amen. Amen. Our country is quickly turning pagan but <laughs> because we're suffering for truth, you can turn the radio on this Saturday and get on your faithful Christian station and hear 12 and a half ways how to go to heaven. And this one says it's already, I mean, he says come and join our church and you'll be a part of the frozen chosen. <laughs> and then this one over here says give a little more money. And that one over there says, come and a little light a candle and see if we can get the old man out of purgatory. And listen, we're in America and we're listening to the, to the Christian radio station and, and, if, and if you've got one eye and a half since you'll read your Bible and find out what God has to say about these things. This country's going pagan because of the mumbo jumbo. I tell you, it's a lack of truth. Let me go on. Secondly, he said there's not enough mercy. Now, God is not preaching to himself. He's a preaching to me. And so God is not talking about his mercy. He's talking about you and I having mercy on one another. He's talking about the Christian community, having mercy on the Christian community. And then he's talking about us having mercy on the world. Yes, yes, yes. He said, add godliness. Add godliness. So we're to be gracious how can you and I, how can we be saved by the grace of God, filled with the Spirit of God, and not be gracious? Why is it we want God to have mercy upon us and forgive us, and then we want Him to slap the pud out of somebody else? And we even expect it. We expect it. Hey, hey, we'll say, God's going to get you for that. Boy, I'll tell you, God will get you for that. Boy, you better quit that. God's liable to kill you for that. What kind of a God do we represent? You think God's walking around with a hatchet? Yeah. <laughs> hey, the Bible does it now. Some Catholic organization might put you in such superstition you'd walk around and tremble, but our God is a, a wonderful God and a loving God. <laughs> and, and he's long-suffering to us we're not willing that he should perish. He's a God of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. He's a good God, say amen. amen. He is a God of wrath as well as a God of love, but I don't expect him to turn loose his wrath as much as I expect him to turn loose with his love. I expect him to bless you and be good to you. Amen. Amen. After all, it's the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. Romans 2, 4. Amen. Amen. I heard a country preacher a week or so in Georgia, a week or so ago, three, four weeks ago, preaching on hell. And his sermon was, Luke 16, and his sermon was, notice how good God was to the rich man. Talk about his family, how his brothers were still at home, how he knew something about Abraham, knew something about the Word of God, had good health, had money. And it was four or five things there he brought out how good. He said, look how good God had been. He said, if there'd ever been a Jew that should have got saved, he said, it ought to have been that fellow. Because the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We ought to expect God to be a God of mercy and of God of love and of God of grace. And then when God begins to reprimand and criticize Israel, he said, hey, hey, here's a problem. There's just not enough mercy. And God hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Now, if I were preaching that in Jerusalem, I'd say right here in Jerusalem, but here I am in uh, uh, Emmaus, Pennsylvania. And God has a controversy, a quarrel. A quabble, a wrestling match, a debate, a rebuke, a chide, a complaint with the inhabitants of the land. And don't you think you can 
wrestle with him because he's a man of war. And you say, well, what's the big deal? What's, what's, what's the, not enough truth, not enough mercy. God wants us to have mercy on each other. Not just ask God to have mercy on us. What did Jesus say? What did he say? He said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That's what it said. And then not enough knowledge. Not enough knowledge. There again, we're becoming pagan. We're letting the television set educate our children. We're letting Walt Disney's witchcraft and these other little things that come along during the day. And, and uh, what's that thing now, that, that educational program during the day? Uh, that little kids watch all the time? Sesame Time? Sesame Street fella told me last week that he was watching Sesame Street and had these gay characters coming on Sesame Street now. These gay characters come on Sesame Street. Not enough knowledge of God. And this paganism is showing up on every level. My heart just throbbed for, for Chief Justice Roy Moore in Alabama and how he, and he's a Baptist and claims to be saved and wanted to display the Ten Commandments to a crowd that thinks it's just the Ten Suggestions and how they've defrocked him and taken away his authority and placed him out just because he wanted to display the blessed Word of God. I mean... Does, doesn't our society realize that in the United States of America there are a little over 4,000 statues and pictures of Moses holding the Ten Commandments in the courthouses, in the county seats, in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Tennessee, and West Virginia? A little over 4,000 pictures and statues, most of them statues, of Moses standing there holding the tablet, Moses, standing there holding the thou shalt not, thou shalt not, a little over 4,000. I mean, it's a, part, it's a part of our society. Our law system's based on it. No, no, you can't let people see that. You can't let people, and while that case was pending, they sent a bunch of brats in there to build a big plywood wall and to put that big plywood wall up in front of that in case somebody might come by and see it. Now, they could have placed some naked dude out there and called it modern art, you know, or something. Been all right, you know, put the, 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 the centerfold out of Playgirl or Playboy magazine up there, but somebody might see that. Oh, it might really hurt them if they was to see that. Some, some stupid atheist, and I can qualify that, the fool hath said in his heart there's no God. Might come by and be offended if he's to see the ten, the ten, ten commandments. He might get saved if he'd see the Ten Commandments. Listen, mark her down. We're sick. We're in a mess. This country's in a mess. No knowledge of it. And then recently the Supreme Court system, you know, uh, come across with this thing to make it okay for gays to do their thing. And all that is is the pressure of the Vatican and the Roman Catholic hierarchy putting pressure on our Supreme Court to change the law to turn some of their little pedophiles loose. And the next day, they were already on the street in California. I mean, they made it retroactive. Now, this speeding ticket you got. <laughs> now, now, if, now if, if, it's, if, if the speed limit's 55, and I'm doing 65, and I break the law, and I get caught, and I get a ticket, and I pay for it. Say amen. Then, a few weeks later, they come by and they decide they're going to change the speed limit on that street and they raised it to 65. Do I get my money back? <laughs> well, that's what they did. That's what they did. <clears throat> come along and say, well, that's okay now. If you want to rape somebody's little boy, it's okay. It'll be all right now. And then they turn that bunch of dudes loose after they've been tried and convicted and sentenced and already locked up. They're going to turn them loose. Sound like a bunch of junk to me. That crowd's crooked as a bunch of fish hooks, and you know it. But the problem, the problem is no knowledge of God, no knowledge of God, no knowledge of God in the land. They're going to try to make it against the law to read from the King James Bible in public because it's sexist in that it emphasizes the male gender. God is our father, and he's not our mother. And in that it, it's saying, then it's racist in that it emphasizes the Jew. God chose the people of the Jew, not us honky Caucasians. And the Bible does emphasize the Jew. So this racist and it's, and it's sexist. Isn't it, isn't it something when a bunch of little old pea brain germs 
rise up in God's face and, and, and disagree with him. We believe you're wrong. We believe it's our father or mother which art in heaven. I mean, who are we to shake our little puny fist in the face of God? We're not big as an ant. He said, then there's too much swearing. Now, now that gets, I'm staying with the verses now, you see. He said, no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God. Verse 2, by swearing, by swearing. And he's having to do with the language. And I've been trying to get prepared for a future event in the book of James, and, and I notice a whole chapter now, in every chapter, James deals with that tongue, in every chapter. But chapter three devotes almost an entire chapter to the, the poison and the power and the possibility and potential of the tongue. God Almighty in heaven hears what we say, not just when we're praying. We think, you know, that's all the time of years. And then we can just, you know, just come in and they tell you something. <laughs> but the only time he really hears this is, is when we're in prayer. And my friend Theodore Sutton, now he's from Maggie Valley, North Carolina, ghost town in the sky. And Theodore married a girl from New Jersey, just right over here across the river, named Betty. And so Theodore... Now, Betty was saved, and Theodore was under conviction. He's under conviction when they got married. <laughs> Theodore, was a, Theodore was a rock mason uh, on the side and a full-time coon hunter. <laughs> you, you sportsmen understand, say amen. I mean, he made money laying rock, but all he walked and talked was coon dogs. And Theodore, the Holy Spirit was really dealing with him. And Theodore had two brothers that loved the Lord, and, and they was praying for him, and then the local preachers praying for him down in Maggie Valley. And, and his water got so hot. I mean, when it gets too hot in the kitchen, you have to get out of the smoke. So he said, let's move to Jersey. We'll move up right around your mom and daddy. So I get to get away from these fanatics. So Theodore pulls out, packs up his U-Haul, moves over here to Jersey, brings his coon dog with him. Well, when he gets over here to Jersey, the first night he's here, he's going to turn his coon dog. He said, that dog's been locked up in that box so long. I'm going to turn him out and let him exercise. I'm going coon hunt. Which way to go? They said, go right in there, so-and-so, so-and-so, down to the river. And, the good... and so he turns the coon dog loose, and he got lost. Now, he's in Jersey. In those mountains, you can't lose a mountain man because of the hollers and the creeks. And... But, but you get them in a swamp where they don't know and they can get lost. So he's over here in Jersey, lost. The dog's gone out of here and don't know where the dog is. He's out there just wandering around. Now, he's under deep conviction. I mean bad conviction. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, finally, he sees a real dim lantern light. He said, it wasn't a gas lantern. There's no kerosene, no coal oil lantern. He said, it's all that old yellow light, light walking like that. He said, uh, hey! The fellow didn't say a thing. He said, I started going to that light. He said, I got over there, and it was an old white-headed man with a long white beard carrying this lantern. And he said, I was a hollering him, but he couldn't hear me because he was about deaf. And he said, I got up to him, and he said, there you are. Theodore said, you know me? Well, he said, yes and no. He said, the Holy Ghost got me out of bed an hour ago and told me to come down here and tell you, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. Amen. He turned around. <laughs> so old Theodore fell down on the ground and started crying. He said, what in the world? But he said, that fellow got gone from me. He said, I'm still lost in the woods. So he starts, he starts walking and walking and walking. Finally, he came out called a ride that took him back to his truck and he got back to bed and said, Betty, pack her up. So we're, now this is, this is in the spring of the year just before Easter. And he said, pack her up, Betty. We're going back to North Carolina. I said, I got to get saved. And she said, well, well Ted, you can, get, you can get saved right here. Nope, so I'm going to get saved in North Carolina. That's where I'm going. I said, the Lord's a deal with my heart, so I'm going to go back and get saved. She said, well, you need to get some sleep. He said, if I go to sleep, I'll die and go to hell. And she said, well, you can't drive home unless you get some sleep. He said, you lay there and go to sleep. And now his wife told me this too. He said, well, he said, if you'll, if you'll sit down there beside me and watch me while I sleep. And he said, now, if I grunt or if I just struggle or anything, you promise you'll wake me up. She said, I promise, Ted, I'll watch you. And said, if you start to die, I'll wake you up. And so he, he got him a nap. He got him a nap. They went back to North Carolina. He said, uh, she, she said that he is drunk, real drunk, and he started trying to get over it. And he was sick and on DTs and shaking and all of that and trying to get over it. And so she said, I was sitting at the kitchen table reading my Bible. And said, he came in there. That's what I meant to tell you to start with. He said, he came in there and he said, Betty, pray for me. He said, I'm going to die. I'm so sick. I'm going to die. And uh, she said, well, 
Theodore, you're drunk. He said, I know it. Said, I said, pray for me. I'm going to die. She said, well, okay, get down on your knees. So he got down on his knees, and she said, dear Lord, Theodore's drunk. He said, don't tell him I'm drunk. Tell him I'm sick. <laughs> He said, tell him I'm sick. <laughs> some people think, some people think that God doesn't know anything unless you tell him. And some people think that he doesn't hear you talk except when you're praying. But he hears you when you think. Amen. He knows every word you've said today, and you don't even know what you've said today. And he doesn't have to have a computer system. He knows everything that we say. That's serious, isn't it? Our language. Now, some of you today said hell or damn. And that's so serious because you see, you're not just cursing, you're taking God's word out of context. And he said he would honor his word above his name. And if someone used God's name in a big old long blah, 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 like the fellow did today in the store, I heard him over here, you know, using the Lord's name. Uh, in vain, you know, bailing up to the bar and cussing. But then you think that's more serious than saying hell or damn, don't you? He said it honor his word above his name. Hell is a Bible word. Damn is a Bible word. And when you hell this and damn that, you are taking God's word in vain. And then when you and I use God's name out of its proper setting, we're taking God's name in vain. So many of the southern preachers have gotten into this bless God and bless God. and Don't let that get started in here. It, it's so rude. Even when a liberal politician gets up and says some, something and a crowd goes, boo, boo. I, I say, oh, they shouldn't do that. That's so rude. I mean, I mean, let the fellow have his say. I mean, you don't agree with him. But, no. but when somebody gets up and starts saying bless God this and bless God that, I want to stand up and say, boo, boo. My grandma ought to wash your stinking mouth out with soap. You preachers, don't get into that habit. I went to hear an old friend, went to school with him in the 60s, and he took the Lord's name in vain 66 times during his message. He'd say, bless God. And, and, and it sounded to me like he was cursing. Don't get into that habit as you teach and as you preach. If you want to bless God, say it like, like David did. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and let all that is within me bless his holy name. Amen. Amen. That'll be okay. But when you just use it as a crutch and you just, uh, God's name is sacred. And, and you don't have to be drunk. All you have to do is use it out of context. Don't let your little girl say, golly, gosh, or walk outside and say, Dear Lord, it's cold. And I hear some Yankees say, Jeez, don't do that. And oftentimes they say, Jesus Christ, give me a break, will you? Jesus Christ. You're taking God's name out of context. You're using God's name empty, empty, frivolously. Out of con You're taking God's name in vain. And then there are other ways to take God's name in vain. The writer of Proverbs said in Proverbs 30, he said, at least I become poor and steal and take God's name in vain. Mm, what? Listen, that word take is like when, when you were born, you took your daddy's name. And when, and when your wife married you, she took your name. And if she runs off and leaves you, she's taking your name in vain. And when you steal, there's such a contrast between his character and your character, you took his name in vain. As a matter of fact, any act of hypocrisy on the part of a born-again child of God, any act of hypocrisy, any sin traffic in your life or my life, we're taking God's name in vain. We're taking the name Christian in vain. We're taking the name child of Jehovah God in vain because there's such a contrast between what our character is displaying and what his character is. We're taking God's name in vain. Problem with speech. Come on, say amen. 
Hallelujah, you were having a time. He said, then in, in lying, in lying, and we lie to our husbands, and we lie to our wives, and we lie to our children, and we lie to our parents, and we lie to our teachers, and we lie to God, and then we're so stupid, we lie to ourselves. Some of you are trying to convince yourself that you're a child of God. You know you don't have what it takes. You know you don't have what it takes. If it were not for your husband, you wouldn't be here tonight. If it wasn't for your Christian wife, you wouldn't have made it. Hadn't been for your children saying, come on, Daddy, you wouldn't have made it. Listen, you know on your own you don't have what it takes. You know that you're a hypocrite. You know that you're not a child of God. But you keep trying to tell yourself, well, if I do this and I do that and go here and go there, surely I can go to heaven when I die. Honey, you need Jesus. Desperately, you need Jesus. Don't leave this world without him. He's the only way to get out of here alive. Oh, how you need him. And, and it's one thing, you know, to try to deceive someone else. But when you lie to yourself, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We talked last night about deception and how that's one of the devil's main talents. You have a reason to be upset with someone when they deceive you. My, my, how we deceive ourselves. Lie. You say, who? Well, anyone that hears the Word of God and doesn't do it. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. Amen. Then it said, killing. God saw Abel's blood soaking down into the sand, and God saw someone. To, I mean, there's so much killing. You turn the radio on, and every major city is having at least one murder every night. Now, if you're in Tampa, it's three a night. If you're in Philadelphia, it's two a night. If you're uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, it's four a night because there's a million people inside the circle in 375 independent Baptist churches. And this is dead, and that is dead, and that is dead. Now, where was I last, last week? 15-year-old, somebody walked in this way, just, just blew him away. And then two people shot in a car. And then, I mean, it's kill, 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 kill. They, they learn that watching television. You let your children watch that tube seven hours and 45 minutes a day is the average in America. You let them watch that thing and see all them murders and all them cuttings and stabbings and killings and shootings and lynchings and killings and killings and then you back one of them in the corner. He knows what to do with you, buddy. I mean, right there below the house. I mean, he's trying to get his mama to give him some money. She knew he was buying cocaine. And he just grabbed a claw hammer out of the door and killed her. His mother. Stuffed her in the back of his car and drove up there to blowing rock, almost to blowing rock, and dumped her out. And they found his car tracks, and the front end was messed up in the car, and it was a flat place on one of the tires, and they just took a plaster pair of that track and came right to him, showed it to him, and said, that was your car. He's building in his time now. Killed his mother. Killed his mother. I guess he saw that on HBO. Then it said stealing. And there again, we, I mean, you know something everybody's doing, everybody's doing. And it's not a matter for something big, something small. Paul told Timothy, he said, not peril on him. Does anyone know what that means? It means not bringing home grain in your pockets after you've reaped the field. Not bringing home nails in your pocket if you're a carpenter. Not bringing home stamps in your purse if you're a secretary or a few extra envelopes. Not bringing home tools from the shop. You love your mother-in-law, say amen. And see, God knows. Oh, you said I don't pay me enough down there anyway. I, I should have had a raise last year. And I, you're a thief. You are a thief. You are a thief. And God's a watching you. Oh, the foreman, he's over on another job, but God is watching you. God is watching you. He said this stealing, all this shoplifting, all these things. You know, when we go to the school and cheat and steal grades and some of you hypocrite children are taking the pencil and writing down the answers on the sole of your foot, that's what I used to do. <laughs> There's none on there right now. And then they'll write the write the the the... You know, they'll memorize the code system 174 and write it on their fingernails, you know, or in the palm of their hand. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I 
You're stealing when you steal a grade. You're stealing when you steal the credit that someone else should have received. You're stealing when you take the glory from God that's only his. Stealing, stealing. He said there's too much lying, too much killing, and too much stealing. And then you steal from God. And then, then you know your daddy's pockets full of one dollar bills and he'll never miss it. And you know where mother hangs her purse? Well, I'll tell you something, friend. God saw you take that money out of mama's purse. You're a thief. You might ought to get saved. You're a thief. And then he said, committing adultery. Now, we want the preachers to get off of that, you know, because we're living in a modern day and, you know, it's all right to have two wives and a couple lovers on the side. I tell you, we better preach, preach, preach. We better read our Bible. You better stay with your wife. You say, well, but she's lost her, her, her teenage figure. She's had four of your children, you hypocrite. <laughs> Husband, love your, love your wives. And the wife of thy youth, be not, deal not treacherously with the wife of thy youth, he said. Oh, stay with your wife. I know sometimes it's, sometimes it's hard on you, sometimes it's hard for her. <laughs> but feed your love. Court your spouse. Spend quality time with her lover and appreciator and, and, and develop a deep love and appreciation and respect for one another. Stay together, stay together, stay together. Stay together. I'll tell you, I don't know what you're going to do with this adultery thing. I, you don't want me to preach on that. And then not just that kind of adultery, but then this other, I mean, Jesus traced it back to our little minds and looking and looking upon a woman or upon a man. Jesus traces it back. Hey, according to what Jesus said, and if you don't mind, I'm going to believe him. According to what he said, you commit adultery and not take your britches off. Never even speak to her. And commit adultery with her. Which means she had something to do with it. It's probably because it split all the way up to her unmentionables. Then when she sews up that split, she still looks like she's wearing a sock. The Bible, the, does it matter? Does it matter to you? Does it matter to you? Good looking, does it matter to you? The Bible. Good looking, does it matter to you? The Bible. The Bible. It said that women should adorn, that means put it in order, themselves, that means you can't blame it on someone else, in modest, that means covered. Apparel, there's the word, catastol. Catastol. Now you're to adorn yourself in modest apparel. Catastol. Now catastol means long, let down, and flowing. Now most independent Baptist ladies think they're modest if they have on a dress versus a pair of jeans. Some jeans are more modest than your dress. But most independent Baptist ladies think that they are, they are, they are, they, they really got under control because they wear dresses. I wasn't testifying the other night how the Lord saved her and convicted her. Them old tight blue jeans, she'd have to get in a bathtub, you know, and get them wet and put them on when, when, and then let them shrink to her, her body. And she looked like she was wearing blue pantyhose. And she said, I was convicted of that. And she said, I burn all that outfit. And now she said, thank God I'm wearing dresses. Well, that's good. Say amen. Say amen. But come on. The Bible did not just say dresses. It said kato. That's apparel. It means long, let down, and flowing. Now what that means is, and I hate to demonstrate this the way I'm built. <laughs> Will you bear with me just a minute, honey? Now listen. Honey, that means there has to be enough material in your outfit so you can walk under it and they can't see your Coca-Cola bottle figure. One fella said he married his wife because she had a figure like a Coke bottle and said it turned out to be a three liter. <laughs> Listen, when those, truck, when those truck drivers go down there to buy them one of them mud flaps that's got that naked woman on that mud flap, well, none of the details of that woman's body is on that mud flap. It's just the silhouette. It's usually chrome, 
and it's just, it's just stamped out, and it's just the shape. I mean, pornography is not just the nude body, but it's the silhouette. It's the shape. No one has any business knowing how you're put together, not even your daddy. That's reserved for your husband. Amen. And you ladies need to realize that when you buy a, a dress from the store, and it's got that old split in it, and then you sew that. Now, the reason that split's there is because that dress is not really large enough for you to walk unless there's a split. Because your legs, I mean, you can't climb the steps. Because, and that's why the split's there. All right, you sew up about half that split. And there you go, coming to church, look like you're wearing a sock. And every little curve and every little motion. And, and hey, you don't leave anything for the imagination. But to get you a dress that has enough room in it till it's long let down flowing and you can come walking before this crowd and no one can tell. A Christian's dress is supposed to conceal her figure, not reveal it. Right. Why well, not being mean or ugly? Well, I think you're pretty as a bunch of baby dolls. I just believe you need to get right with God and stop trying to show off the way you're built and the way you're made. Then these little girls get about 14, 15, they start looking like a woman, and we let them put on these tight sweaters, you know, and they'll go to those tight sweaters. Hey, you, you see, but she's so cute, and she's just now starting to, to grow up and, and develop. And to, well, I know she's beautiful, but when you start that when she's 12 and 13, you'll never be able to stop it. Then when she's 38, 22, 36, she'll still be dressing like that. And you're the blame, Ma. But teach her modesty. I know why you won't teach her. It's because you don't wear that kind of dress yourself. You like them tight sweaters yourself, don't you? you turn all the eyes. It's a, the, you, some of you ladies are so pretty. It's a wonder some of these men don't have cricks in their necks. I wasn't looking at you. You know, you know what the, the Lord's let. You know what the Lord's doing. He's letting us have revival. Hey, I, can, I can feel the breeze in the top of the mulberry bushes. God is letting us have revival. What's happened is night after night, He's let us. He's let us see. Her, and, and God's given us a good atmosphere. And and nobody's. I mean, all week no one has stuck out their old coated tongue at me. I catch you. Well, I have that happen every once in a while. And no one. And no one's cut the tires on the motorhome. And. <laughs> But see what's happened. God is so gracious. Hey, he's sweet. Say amen. amen. And he's so gracious that he's, I don't know, he's given us an, an atmosphere where that we can face our sins and our wrongs and then come and repent. And every night, I feel like I'm getting a little closer to him. And every night, I feel like you're getting a little closer to him. And God's fixing to really get us on the spout where the honey comes out. Well, there's no telling. Wouldn't you like to see him save 100 people next week? And I'm so glad our pastor had wisdom enough to say, let's just preach two weeks. And you're going to miss it if you don't come back next week. I'm telling you. Oh, thank the Lord. And this, this weekend, there's no tellings what will happen here this weekend. Because you see what we're doing. We're, we're sitting through the preaching. And then we're, we're letting God be true and every man a liar. Then we're coming to the altar and repenting. And every night, the church is taking a step toward God. And a step toward His holiness. We're about to have a Holy Ghost explosion. Oh, my. Wouldn't you love to see you at prayers answered, your friends and loved ones say, let me just finish this right here. He said, and then violence. He said, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Let me read a verse to you. I'm in Psalm 11, verse 5. I'm just going to read it to you. Don't turn. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him, H-I-M, him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. That's what it says. You believe the King James Bible? Him that loveth violence, God's soul hateth. I mean, we're entertained by this junk. I mean, that turns us on. 
We wouldn't watch those programs if there were not a little bit of strangling or gagging or shooting or killing or something. A lot of these electronic games, these uh, Pac-Man stuff, and I don't understand all that stuff. I wouldn't know how to turn a computer on. But I'm talking about all these games that these, I mean, these warlords and these martial arts and this whack them and cut their head off. And, all, and little bitty guys, four years old, sitting there eating popcorn, both hands and watching the thing. Oh, just, oh, oh, oh. He said, that's just like my kid. Then you're in bad trouble. God said. God said. Does that matter to you? Does it? God said. Not some preacher who's a nobody and don't even remember my name or anything. But not just your pastor, but as important as he is. But God, God Almighty said, He that loveth violence, my soul hath. Let's stand. Let's stand. Well, again tonight, the Lord is helping us. Again tonight, the Lord is helping us. And the Lord's given us an opportunity to respond. Let me, let me say this. And the Lord put this in my heart about 2 o'clock this afternoon. I notice in the prophets a lot of times, the prophet, when he prays, will confess his sin, and then he'll confess the sins of his people, of his, of his people, of his country. Now, I know that, I know that, you know, that as we try to confess the sins of George Bush and John Ashcroft and Dick Cheney and Colin Powell and Tom Ridge and Dave Rumsfeld and, but no, I'm not necessarily talking about their personal sins. I'm just saying, we're the people of God, Okay. We are the people of God. Say amen. amen. We're the apple of His eye. His thoughts are to us. He's watching us. Let's come tonight. There's room up here for a hundred folks. Let's gather around. And some might want to come to the choir. Some of you men climb up here and make room for the ladies down here. And let's have a church-wide prayer meeting. And let's confess our sin. And then let's confess the sins of our nation. Let's confess this old gambling. It's billions of dollars every year. Shoplifting, $44 billion a year, shoplifting. Uh, the lotteries, let's confess uh, abortion. Let's just confess it to God. Let's confess this old wicked racism. Let's confess... Let's just confess the violence, the entertainment, uh, the pornography, homosexuality. Well, when you, you're perhaps not involved in any of that, but then we are as a country. Sometimes our tax money gets involved in it. Let's just get down before God and confess our sin. Then let's confess the sins of our country. Children, God's going to help us. God is going to help us. He's doing something for us, for our families. Right down here where we're at, He's doing something for us. Let's come tonight as they play softly. Now, if you're not a Christian, it'll be easy for you to just kind of get in the traffic and come right on down here. And if you'll come with a repentant attitude and trust Calvary, trust the blood of Jesus. Don't you trust doing right. Trust the blood of Jesus. Some of you men, come on up here and and leave room in the altar. And let's see if we can get a couple hundred folks down here. And I want us to pray. I want us to pray. That's it. Come right on. Come on up on the platform. Make room down here. Some of you men, come right on up. Now, on these front rows, there's room. Honey, right there on that front row. You can kneel right there on that front row. And on this side, on the front row, that's a good altar. Excellent altar. Right there, honey. Just on that front row. On this room, come right on, David. Come on, David, right on down here. And on that front row, or the second row, or in that aisle. David, you can just get right in there and get out on your knees at that pew. There's many, there's other, several others coming down this center aisle. That's fine. That's fine, sweethearts. Just precious little girls, just kneel right there. And if you want something to lean on, just get on that pew there. Others want to come, won't you come? We're going to confess our sins and get right with God, and then we're going to plead for America. Let's plead for Pennsylvania. 
Let's plead for Emmaus, Pennsylvania, for our community, for our neighbors. Now, let's bow our heads. Those of you in the audience can be seated. You can be seated out there in the audience. Be seated. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're somewhere now in a posture of prayer and, and you'd love for someone to come and pray with you, perhaps you're not a Christian, or maybe, you're, maybe you know you're saved, but you're so far out of the will of God, you just, you're so miserably backslidden and cold toward God, and tonight you want to really come back to God. You'd love for someone to come and pray with you. Just lift your hand up and keep your hand up, and the pastor will come or he'll send someone else to you to pray with you. If you're not a Christian or if you're, if you're out of the Lord's will and you want to get things right with the Lord, just lift your hand and hold it up and someone will come to you that loves you. They won't pry or ask questions or embarrass you, but they'll come and pray with you. Right now, just lift your hand. Someone will come. All right, let's pray now. You'll pray about your own life. Pray about your close loved ones that are around you. Please stay in the altar if you can. If you don't have some physical infirmity, just stay right here. Our pastor is going to lead us in prayer in a moment. Pray about your own life, your immediate loved ones, as the Lord leads. But don't finish praying till you've prayed for our country and confessed the sins of our nation. Pastor Hamilton. 